Hi everybody, Brian James here from rhino3d.com and in this video I want to talk about texture mapping. Texture mapping is the process of how an image in a material gets wrapped around a 3D model. So if you had a picture of wood or stone in a material, how does that picture get stretched around a 3D model? That's called texture mapping. Texture mapping is also referred to as UV mapping or simply UVs. Now here I've got this casual sneaker model and I'll set up a new material in my materials panel. I'll click the plus symbol and create a physically based material. I'll click the detailed settings and add a base color channel. And I'll click to assign a texture within that color channel. I'll choose from more texture types and pick a 2D checker texture. This is just to get the mapping right. I don't necessarily want a 2D checker texture in the final material. I'll select all my objects, and in this case that includes some NURBS poly surfaces, some meshes, and some sub-D surfaces. I'll right-click the material swatch for the material I just created and choose Assign to Objects. The default mapping method is defined in the texture itself, so if you click the texture, its mapping section will indicate that it's using mapping channel 1 and by default that will be surface mapping and that means something different for different objects. A NURBS poly surface will use the control point structure and the U and V direction on each surface for surface mapping. A mesh might import some UVs if you used an OBJ or FBX file when you brought it in or it might inherit the UVs from the object it was created from. Sub-D objects will pack faces into as few islands as it can, and those quads will become a packed region for the texture. Clearly though, none of this looks like a checker texture by default. So the first thing I want to show you is that you can use this WCS option, which stands for World Coordinate System. World Coordinate System box style will project the checker texture from six sides of a box surrounding the scene. So this is your fastest way to get a texture that looks like what you might expect. The WCS option without box style is a sphere around the whole scene. And it'll look different, but if you had a spherical shaped object or something more organic, the regular WCS option can often be better. Screen mapping will map the texture based on the normal of your camera. And the environment map option will take the texture and wrap it into an environment sphere. Mapping channel 1 is the most flexible, but it requires you to adjust the object's texture mapping settings individually. So if I select the poly surface for the outsole on the bottom of the sneaker, I can go into the properties panel, then the texture mapping section. And here I have surface mapping shown as the type. So that is the mapping channel 1 information set in the material. You can lock the repeat value at the bottom of the texture mapping settings and change it to see the result of tiling a texture more than once. And this is important because we can see any contraction or expansion of that texture based on the control point structure of the surfaces in this NURBS poly surface. If we explode it and use the rebuild command to rebuild both of these surfaces and I give it a lot of points, the control point structure is now even so we don't get that contraction or expansion of the texture. I'll join these two surfaces back together now and now we could adjust that repeat individually per object, so outside of the material itself. And this is the advantage of doing it this way. The repeat value in the texture in the material is still one by one, but it's pointing to mapping channel one for each object, so this repeat value gets used. I'll select the sidewalls of the upper here, and I'll use a different mapping method, planar mapping. Now you can change the mapping method in one of two ways here, in its object properties. You could use this type dropdown and choose planar mapping, or you could use the icon here 
in the list of icons for the texture mapping options and you'll be given steps to follow in the command line. So if I click apply planar mapping, the command line is going to ask for the first corner of a plane. The construction plane that I'm in or the viewport that's active is pretty significant here because this will align the plane. So I'll maximize my right view so I know I'm in this view and I'll use the bounding box option which will give me the smallest possible rectangle around my selections. The coordinate system I'll use is C plane, which will be the construction plane of this view, so I'll just press enter. And the UV and UVW step, you can leave it on UV for almost all cases. UVW is used for 3D procedural textures. And now if I go back to perspective, I'm projecting from a plane set up in the right view. I want to see the mapping for that projection, and that's called the mapping widget. This icon here in the texture mapping properties for these objects will show that mapping widget. And it'll look like this dotted yellow line. You can scale it, move it around, rotate it, and all of this will impact the look of the texture. It'll also make it repeat more or less just given the size of the mapping widget. Now remember I have two objects selected here so if I deselect and click right here you'll see the selection menu pop up. There's more than one mapping widget. So if you do this mapping adjustment with the widget for more than one object I suggest dragging a window selection so you know you get both and move them in unison. I'll scale in 2D here, I'll hold down shift and click and drag on that two axis handle, like that. And then when I don't need the mapping widget up anymore, I can use this icon to hide the mapping, or you can use the command mapping widget off. The counterpart was just mapping widget if you wanted to do it with commands. For this front portion here of the toe, I'll use spherical mapping. And this time, rather than using the icon to set up the mapping method, I'll use the type drop-down list instead and just set it to spherical. I'll then need to show the mapping widget so you can see where the mapping will automatically be placed if you just use the drop-down. And that location is at the world origin. So 0, 0, 0 in X, Y, and Z space. And you can drag this back and forth. If you select the object itself, you can change your repeat values. And in the case of a sphere, that's going to point out the existence of a pole on the sphere. But if we drag that back like this, we can hide the pole just simply by having it out of the way. Or you can rotate the sphere back so that it's not part of the, uh, the look of the texture. I'll hide the mapping widget. And then for the tongue, I'll use the match mapping. Match mapping is this icon, and you'll be asked in the command line to select a source object. I'll pick the piece that I just did with spherical mapping. And this, this tongue is now using the same mapping widget, but it's its own mapping widget that can then be individually adjusted. So I'll click Show Mapping and drag it back just a little bit more so the pole of, of the sphere is not involved in the tongue. And then hide mapping. For the laces, I have a bunch of mesh objects that were joined together into one disjoint mesh. And they do not have any geometry underneath, so they're open underneath. And that's going to be important for unwrapping. It means I don't have to select any seams, any edges in the meshes, uh, to allow the unwrap to work. And unwrap is like if we had cut these open and then just smushed them down onto a table. And it's this first option here, unwrap. You'll be asked in the command line to select seams. And since they're open underneath, we don't have to select any seams. We can just press Enter. I want to see the unwrapped result, so I use the UV Editor command, and that's the last icon here, and I make two clicks. It doesn't matter how big this is, but it will show the individual islands in the UV space. 
And anything you want to do here will change the way the texture looks. So you can scale, rotate, reposition, align, distribute, however you like to adjust how these look. And you'll have this either docked or floating UV editor. So any changes you make in UV space, you'll have to click apply to get those to update. And now I'll take the laces and I'll change my repeat value like that. I'll do an unwrap for these two sub D surfaces as well. And just like the laces, these actually were modeled with no geometry on the underside. This is just a concept model. So I don't have to select any seams and I'll just use unwrap and then enter and lock the repeat value together again and change my repeat value. Maybe I don't want it to be that dense, something like that. For the area in the back of the shoe where your ankle will be, I have a single sub D and this sub D can be unwrapped. So I'll use the unwrap command again. It doesn't have a thickness, so we don't have to select any seams. It should just flatten out. But I do want that flattened UV island to be symmetrical. So there's an option when running the unwrap command of symmetry tip. Symmetry tip by default will align the rectangle that you define with the active construction plane. So if I do it without any options, it'll be aligned with the top C plane. But if I use the vertical option, I can use a vertex O snap and then define a vertical plane of symmetry. And I don't select any seams, so I just press enter. And then I'll change my repeat value here like that. This last piece on the back is a closed sub D. So I'll use the isolate command here. And my sub D wires need to be on. There we go. Because I want to use this edge loop to actually separate it. So I haven't selected any seams so far. So if I control shift double click, you can see I get that whole edge loop. If you select your sub D, and use unwrap, you don't have to hold down control and shift when selecting the seams. You can just double click if the unwrap command is, is uh, being run. And then I will use that symmetry tip option again, vertical, and I'll grab a vertex snap and just come straight out and then enter. I'll open up the UV editor here. I didn't do it on the last part where I used symmetry tip. In the UV editor, when you use symmetry tip, it's going to try and keep both sides of the unwrapped island symmetrical. I'm going to select both of these and use the align command, vertical center, and then apply the UV change. And I'll increase my repeat value like that. I'll turn off my sub D wires. I don't need them on and rendered anymore. I'll use the unisolate command to bring back everything else. And so uh, I've got a pretty funky style here, but this is what I wanted to do is just lay out the texture mapping for each object in the model. And now we're free to assign the actual materials we want to use or change the texture used in the material that's currently assigned. I want to make a material from the material library though. So I'm going to import from material library and I'll grab from the textile section this denim material. I'll select everything, right click that denim material and assign to objects. When you import a material from the material library, the textures within that material will be set to world coordinate system. So if I wanted to use the mapping information that I used, I have to set it to mapping channel one. And there's more than one texture here. So you'd have to go through and do it for each 
or you can do it this way. If you select everything that has this material and you go into properties texture mapping, you're now going to see this sentence at the top. Some of the assigned materials are using WCS, so changes may not actually do anything here. If you click this sentence, click here to fix this automatically, it'll change each of the textures within the material to mapping channel one. And so now they're all using the mapping that we set up for each. And maybe I want this to not be tiled 20 by 20 anymore. So you can change it per object. I'm going to go into the material and if I look into those textures you can see what I was just talking about. Mapping channel 1 is now used for both of these. Mapping channel 1, mapping channel 1. I'm going to right click it and choose duplicate to make a duplicate material so that I can have a little variation here. So maybe these objects are all going to get this one. Right click it, assign to objects. And now I can change the color to only be maybe 30% from that texture. And the other 70% is going to come from this color choice here. There's a little pipette or eyedropper tool. You can grab a color from, from the model or a pixel on the screen rather. And I'm going to hit the space bar and then OK just to pick it. And that gives me kind of a starting point. I want it to be, I think, lighter and a little bit more saturated. Yeah, something like that. Oh, I think this piece was better with that. Yeah. And the outsole here, I'll make a new material, new physically based material, and assign it to that. So I want this to look like a gum sole, just have a little texture to it. So I'll add both a base color texture channel, but also a bump channel. And the reason is the same as how I set everything else up. I want the base color to be where I, I get it all looking like I want, and then I'll drag it over to bump. It's just easier to see it in base color. So I'll click to assign a texture there, choose from more texture types, and this time I'll pick a noise texture which is another one of the procedural textures. When you have a procedural texture like this, you've got to change the repeat within the texture itself. Uh, so something like 500, and you're really going to see it. There we go. And then you can just click and drag that texture from base color to bump and release it. And now the color is coming from this base color field right here so we can do our same trick and we can pick a color like that or if you really liked this exact color you could come back over to this material click the drop down next to the color and choose copy color and then go back to that other one click the drop down next to the color field and choose paste color and you'll get the exact same value like that If I want to make this uh, gum texture just pop a little bit more, I can use an ambient occlusion channel within the physically based material. And this is kind of a neat trick that I'll finish up the video with. If I click and drag this texture over to here, I can either hold down the control key to make a copy of it, or I can hold down the alt key to make a linked version of it, an instance of it. I'm going to make a copy because I want to tweak it separately. So I'll hold down control and release, and now I'm making a copy. What ambient occlusion will do is take the texture in that channel and make it look like there's more shadow in those crevices created from that noise texture. If I don't want that shadow to be as intense, I'll take the black color and make it a gray instead, like that. 
throughout the video I've been using the rendered display mode which is great for showing textures and the mapping as you set it up. If you use the ray traced display mode instead you'll get a more physically accurate rendering and you can consider this to be the same as using the render command. When you use ray traced you may see the textures look incorrect for a moment and then the scene will start calculating again. That process is the baking of the textures and this can happen with custom mapping like I've set up here. So you have to give it a few samples and then it will bake those textures and start calculating properly. I'll add a couple changes here. I'll use a material for the ground plane and turn on the sun. Both of these changes being done in the rendering panel. We could change that ground plane material in the ground plane settings as well. Maybe use a metal template so we have some reflection. And you can adjust the polish of that metal and also change the color. And that's how you use texture mapping in Rhino 7. Thanks for watching.